Hello everyone and thank you so much for joining me. Um, I'm so happy and so thankful for being able to give a BNN online lecture and the added bonus of being able to do the last one of the year in the beginning of December, in the beginning of Advent, which is my favorite time of the year. So when I was deciding what to talk about, I decided to go a bit seasonal. So I'm going to take you on a little trip. I'm going to introduce you to a Christmas family, which is uh, part of the Christmas traditions here in Iceland. Very much alive in kicking uh, lore and, and um, tradition with deep, old, complicated roots, which will, I will never be able to give you a full picture of, but I'm going to try to give you at least a hint. Um, one member of that family, his name is Dekkestur, and um, I'm hoping I will be able to introduce you to him somewhere in this video. He has promised to meet me to do the, to the recordings, but I don't know if he will show. Worst case scenario, I will tell you something a little bit extra about him later in the video. But I'm going to tell you about the tradition, the family, what they are today, and ask Stekkestur where they can go from here. But at the eve of December 11th, the first one, Stekkestur, who is actually here in the window with me, roams the land on foot, placing small presents in children's shoes that have been placed in every child's bedroom window for this purpose. And each night until Christmas, the brothers come, one at a night, out from the darkness, to both scare us and treat us with their company in the advent of Christmas and winter solstice. After Christmas, they leave in the same fashion, one at a time, but now without a trace. These 13 nights before and after Christmas are a time of belief and magic for Icelandic children who wait the arrival of the brothers, believe in their power to visit, visit every window and every shoe, each small present solidifying and strengthening their belief. It has been said that Icelandic, the Icelandic lads have managed to travel to other countries, bringing the shoe gifts uh, to Icelandic children that live abroad. But to get that gift over the, over the ocean and all the lands and all the mountains, it is, however, vital to believe in the story. The lads and their extended family are an intricate part of our Advent and Christmas traditions and an important social performance and drama that everybody participates in. For the younger children, the belief is strong. For older par siblings, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, basically all the rest, all of us, everyone, publicly and privately, we all participate and contribute to the social drama that is the belief and tradition of Jólasveinar. It is simple. Doubting the existence of the lads is a private conversation for each child to have with their family. A conversation that usually takes place around the age of eight or nine. But beyond that private conversation, it is simply a fact that the Jólasveinar are real. They do exist. They bring every child a present in one night and they know if you have not been good, uh, not been on your best behavior. Uh, because if you don't behave, you risk actually not getting a present in your shoe, but a raw potato. Well, I would rather have a piece of chocolate, a tangerine, or, or something, some small sweet gift rather than a raw potato. However, I did hear once about a young lady who got a raw potato in her shoe because she had not brushed her teeth or whatever it was that she had done to deserve that potato. But she was so happy about it. And the first thing she said when she woke up in the morning, found a raw potato in her shoe, she said, yay, I'm going to cook it and make mashed potato. 
Here we have part of the family. Not everybody is here, but a few are. Grigla there in the front, the mother of the clan, the cat, and over here next to me is Thakistur himself. Um, hopefully we will be able to find him somewhere, but until then this will be his representative. These figurines are um, made after drawings by uh, Brian Pilkington, who is one of the only one of the few uh, one of the artists that have given us a glimpse into his imagination of how the family looks like. Um, it's a bunch of people with all kinds of differences, similarities as well, like all of us. Like I told you before, they have a very complex uh, family history, and it goes back to. Well, Grilla, the mother of the clan, is of course the first in line. Um, we can find mentions of her in sagas and poems and other th such things from the 15th and 16th century, where she is described as a troll, a man-eating troll. She allegedly has eaten at least one of her lovers, um, but she has a sweet tooth for uh, unbehaved um, children. And as such, she has throughout time been used um, as um, a scare tactic in, in rearing children. And Grilla has actually become the word that we use for something scary to scare children with, even if it is not if it isn't that what particular. She deserves her own research, and she has gotten her own research. So I recommend if you want to know more about Grilla and not least her connection to her sister beings in other female trollish Christmas creatures of Europe, you check out what Terry Gunnell has uh, said and wrote about them, and about Grilla in particular. Now, uh, the Jonasveiner themselves are first mentioned in the 17th century. And they are the children of Grilla. They're actually in those uh, instances, there are a few females in there as well, a few sisters, but they are the children of Grilla. They are very much trollish and they are quite obnoxious and very, very scary and very, very dangerous. They are coming out of the darkness, out of the wilderness, out of the mountains um, during midwinter and they are just being very, very scary for all. And uh, they are coming so much from the wilderness that some of them are even said to come by sea, sailing on skin boats. So they're actually coming from somewhere very, very different from where uh, people are living. So they were very scary. Um, it's then in about 1860 when Jon Atmosson, uh, who collected, uh, edited and prepared for printing the first Dutchin collection in Iceland. And uh, Stakisberg and his brothers here are actually standing on one of the volumes from that collection. Um, and when Almason was gathering his material, he got letters from people around, or mostly men, people around the country from different places, uh, with some legends of Jolos Venar, but also lists of names. And people from different parts of the country were giving him different names and different numbers. So it came together, adding up, adding up, and adding up. Uh, after Altnoston finished his collection and published his collection, more collection was done in the second half of the 19th century. And altogether, there are about 80 names of Jóla Sveinar, few sisters in there, not many, but a few, but about 80 names from a different parts of the country. So it is clear from this that this was very much a living regional um, lore at the time of that uh, collection. And it has, of course, like I've been saying, it kept going, it's still alive, and we are still adding names, and I will give you examples later. Um, many of these names uh, are very descriptive about the role of Jóla um, what they why they were coming and what they were doing. Um, they indicate that they're very food driven and they come to the homestead in the middle of winter when you're maybe getting scared about having enough to survive the winter. It's the darkest time, it's the coldest time and they're coming and they want your food. They're coming to steal the food. Um, and uh, for example, Bjukna 
I don't have him here, but Bjuknakrækir means sausage snapper. Um, Skirgómur, he's there in the front next to his mother. Um, and skir, uh, Skirgómur basically means skir gobbler, and skir is a fresh cheese uh, that is in Iceland usually eaten in a similar fashion to yogurt. Um, and then there are a few that are not... Uh, not necessarily uh, food oriented, but very kind of nasty and creepy. And, and for example, this guy here, Glukka Geir, is basically a window peeper. And we have Falta Fekir, who lifts the hems of ladies' skirts. So, yeah, they're quite nasty. They're after our food and they want to scare the hell out of us in the worst time of year. Um, in the at the turn of the century, just a, a, around the year 1900, there was a bit of a tangle up with our trawlers Jólasveinar and the Danish Jól Nissar, the Christmas Nissar. They're kind of like smallish creatures, kind of like a house LV kind of things, and they're very nice. Our guys are like nasty and creepy and stealing and stuff like that, while the Danish Nissar come and give gifts. Um, this is a bit of a loose element in the history of these guys, but still it seems that they got some influences from Denmark there. Um, and our band of lads, lads starts to adapt new ideas in the society that they come to visit every Christmas. And it keeps going. In 1932, this little thing, it's a collection of uh, poems written uh, by uh, Johannes Urkotlin and it's a, po it's, a, it's a collection of Christmas poems for children. Um, one in there is about Grilla, another one is about the Yule Cat, um, and then there's another one about the 13 lads. There are a few others but let's focus on these ones. So these were, this is poetry, based on old traditions and old legends uh, where these 13 lads are fixed on the pages and in people's minds. So there's, and they kind of uh, solidified the family of Grilla, her 13 sons, their father, Lahpalude, I don't have him here, but then again, he's a bit of a deadbeat, um, and the cat. So in 1932, we all of a sudden have a text that is well-defined, uh, well-structured, builds on the old material, but kind of gives a sense of cohesion. It's not all over the place. And it brings together and kind of uh, we lose part of that regionality that we had with the over 18 names by him choosing these 13. And speak of the creepy ones, the one Faltafeke, the one that sweeps up the um, skirts of the ladies, he did not find that a very prudent thing, a prudent Jólasveik to pre present to the children. So he switched him out for Hurdaskjallir, door slammer, who goes around just being noisy and a bit um, disruptive, to say the least. But so now we have a solidified family, a nuclear family. A few decades later, something very peculiar happens. Um, a folklorist, this, this is happening sometimes in the 1960s, we don't know exactly when, we probably could find out, but never ruin a good story, right? Um, somewhere in the 1960s, probably early 1960s, the national radio calls out Björsson the author of this beautiful book here, which is called Saga Jólana, uh, the saga of Yule or Christmas, the history of Yule, the story of Yul, the story of, of Christmas. They call him up. At this point, Adni Björsson was a pioneering uh, uh, person in the field of folkloristics in Iceland. He was one of the people that started collecting uh, folkways by questionnaires for the um, National Museum and this book and others that he has written are based very much on that uh, collection and research. So he was like in the heat of things at the time and the radio calls him up and says, we need you to come in 
and uh, take part of this debate that is going. So there had been some debate about Jólasveinar giving children gifts in their shoes, but not every child got a gift. And some children got very big and expensive gifts and other did get only got something small. Some children were getting maybe one or two gifts during the month of December. Others were getting a gift every single night from December 1st until Christmas. So it was all over the place. These guys were not, they were not um, being coherent at all. So the radio asks Björsson to come in and take part of this discussion. Being a folklorist, being a Christmas specialist in a way, um, it was clear that he had some connection to this family. He knew them, he knew about them, knew everything about them, and probably had a phone line up there, wherever up there is. So he came in as an authority uh, with a connection to the family. And he says that on behalf of the Bjolasveinar, they had decided that this was a total mess and something had to be done. So from now on, uh, these particular 13 would arrive uh, the la in the last 13 days before Christmas and put a small, affordable gift in every shoe. It could be a tangerine, a piece of chocolate, maybe a new pencil for school, something very small, but uh, something that would make a child happy. And this worked. So all of a sudden, practically every child in Iceland got 13 small gifts in their shoes the last 13 nights before Christmas. This debate about the ex how expensive and big the, the gift in the shoe should be comes up every now and then, however, because we always, like let's say every fifth year or so, we hear rumors about big things landing in the shoes, like an iPhone or a video game or something that is so much bigger than a little piece of chocolate. So we have that discussion still going, but it's only the 13. And with that, the nuclear family was definitely formed not only in poetry, but as a tradition, as part of the Christmas tradition. They still very much are a nuclear family. Um, they still are very, very food oriented. Uh, but instead of being afraid of them coming and stealing our food, we, we share our treats with them. And some children, for example, they leave a pot of skir for skirkummer when he comes around and a piece of cured meat for cured Krekir, who uh, uh, a meat, he, he's not here either, uh, he's, he's a meat snatcher, a meat hook. And he really loves hunky cured, our, our cured Christmas meat, so some people leave something out for him. And the children also leave uh, candles for Kertasnikir. He's actually over there. He's not really sure what to do with the modern wax, wax candles, because his fascination with candles has always been the tallow candles that he can actually eat but he does like the pretty lights, so it's fine. They can still be a bit naughty, and it's no way, I don't think it's ever gonna be possible to shake that out of them completely, but they, have, they are absolutely not as horrible and horrific as they used to be uh, in the early, day, early days. They have remarkably despite of modernity and globalism and technology and all of these things, and even the poetry and, and ra national radio and national TV and all of these things, they are still keeping a little bit of locality. Because if you ask children that live in the capital area here in the southwest of Iceland, where they live, they will tell you that they live in the mountain Asia, which is basically because I'm standing here in my home, it's over there. If you ask children that live in the northern part of the country where they, uh, where they get their mail sent to, they will tell you it's in Dimmeborgir. And Dimmeborgir is a fascinating lava maze fairy tale uh, landscape in the north. And according to those children, they live there. And all of these children are absolutely sure in, the, in their situational 
closeness to the family and they never argue about it. So even if you put a child from one part of the country and the other part of the country together, they just don't talk about it because they both know that they're right. So for the last about 20 years or so, maybe a little bit longer, they, the uh, brothers and the whole family actually have been kind of getting more into flowing with the um, mindset of the 21st century, um, adding to the role of their gift giving um, and kind of, yeah, getting to grips with what's going on, on in our time. Um, this means, among other things, that they have tried to get to grips with some technology, which is one reason why I think uh, Stachester is still a no-show, because we've ha we're having some technical issues regarding communication in that sense, so I'm still hoping that he will show up. Um, but, um, yeah, but, I mean, you can imagine it's not the easiest thing to get a good internet co connection into straight into the mountains, so that's not very... Um, an easy thing to do, but they are trying. Uh, they are also showing up for scheduled events of the modern time. They show up for um, Christmas balls in, in um, uh, companies where parents are working. They also come to the schools and the kindergartens. Uh, and they also sometimes show up unannounced into uh, events like um, Christmas markets, like the one that I'm actually standing in right now, even though it's closed and nobody's here. It's a very pretty very pretty sight, and I'm pretty sure that every weekend that this market is open, there are some Yola Svener that will show up unannounced, of course. Um, there's another thing that they have kind of uh, added to their thing, and that is clothing. Traditionally, they are clothed in uh, more like homespun, woolly clothes with maybe not the brightest of colors, um, clothing that is kind of in the it kind of 18th century-esque in uh, how it looks. But they have been, for the last few decades, they have also been uh, showing up in the red and white outfit of St. Nicholas and other Santa Clauses of the world, um, kind of depending on where they are and who they're talking to and, and so on. Um, regarding the other Santa Claus, specifically maybe like um, this idea about a Santa Claus that lives in the North Pole, the Coca-Cola Santa kind of idea. Uh, children in Iceland are very clear on that the 13 Jólasveinar are theirs. They tend to them during this time of the year, while the other one is more like a distant Christmassy figure that kind of takes care of other children around the world. So they know about him, but uh, it's the lads that are here for them during their um, everyday life. I mean, how could they not be part of everyday life when they sneak into their bedrooms through windows and put gifts in their shoes every night? Um, but part of the negative side of getting to grips with the 21st century and, and the um, last kind of the, the exchange of the century is that they have also fallen kind of into the, the, into the pit of um, capitalism around Christmas, so the capitalist idea of the modern Xmas, they have definitely gotten kind of into that. Maybe not on purpose, but they are there. They We can see them in Christmas advertisements uh, for a long time now, every before Christmas, um, the milk cartons in Iceland change the design. They go from mjölk to jóla mjölk. Uh, so milk to Christmas milk, and they the uh, there are little pictures of the Jólasveinar on the cartons. They also show up on, for example, seasonal ice cream, candy bars, and kind of for the grown-ups, they also kind of sneak into the alcohol and, and beer and ale uh, of the season. So a good example is... Um, uh, a non-alcoholic beer called Froðusleikir, which is also how this lively um, tradition is kind of working with um, the, the, the fact that the 13 are kind of holy. They are kind of for the, the family and holy for the children. So when it comes to some grown-up issues like beer, 
we get new names because we have this tradition of all the names, so it's open for business to add to it. So Froðursleikir means foam liquor, which is very beer-sounding Jólasve, and very much in uh, in coordinates with other food-related names of the Jólasve. Just to give an example of a few, there's like Skirgámur, Skirgábler, there is uh, Ketkrókur, Meat, Hooker, uh, Bjúkna Krækir, Sausage, Snatcher, and so on. So they kind of, um, they kind of uh, get in in there with that. Um, but the downside, well, one more, one more very important Yolos, right? the 14th, that is definitely not for the children. This one is definitely for the grown-ups because it doesn't arrive until February and he is called Kart Klipper, Korta Klipper. So he comes in February to snip the credit cards of the grown-ups after Christmas. Um, but to kind of try to balance out this element of commercialism and capitalism and everything. And I mean, in both cases, they have kind of gotten more into um, humanitarian work and try to encourage us to give gifts that keep on giving um, and things like that to kind of draw out a little bit of the um, materiality and, and support, for example, children that don't have much in the world and so on. So they have tried to get into that um, kind of uh, work as well to kind of balance this out. Um, so it, it's clear that they have proven to be very adaptable to the social landscape of each time. And I think that is something that has been going for a long time basically from the beginning, they have always been a very strong mirror of our society and they will continue to do that. Now, where can they go from staying with the, the, their main role of, of bringing gifts and, and uh, joy and, and a little bit of naughtiness into the Advent time, uh, to the commercialism, to the humanitarian work, where can they go next? There's a reason why me and Stekkestur have been talking about his possible role in activism for a long time. But he's not here. I'm going to see if I can find him somewhere else. So, where can we go from here? I still haven't found Stekkestur. I don't think he is coming. I'm sorry about that. But, who is he? Well. Um, he is the first of the Jorosveinar, and in the old days, the first time when he came to town, or came to the homesteads, he always began by going into the sheep huts, because he wanted a sip of milk from the, um, straight from the uh, sheep, from the ewes. Really loved that milk, and was willing to do quite a lot to get it, um, being one of the food-oriented uh, lads, of course. But it turns out that not only is it an impossible task to get a milk from a ewe in the middle of December as they are in heat, but also sheep huts are quite narrow and not very accessible when you have a body that uh, looks and moves differently from maybe most people that can easily kind of squeeze into tiny little uh, sheep huts. And I think, well, if you would ask a child today who is their favorite Jólasveit, uh, Stekkestur is probably one of the last ones to be mentioned and I think there are two reasons for it. Number one, uh, they don't recognize his love of sheep milk. Um, he has now realized that he will never get a sheep milk in the middle of December but he has developed a taste for good imported pecorino and we share that me and, and Stekkestur, we both love pecorino. But children don't know that, and they don't know the taste of the sheep milk, so they don't really get that connection with him. Um, and another thing is that his body is different from theirs. He moves differently. They don't understand what's the, what's the deal about those legs that, when he is described, he is described as having either stiff legs, unbending knees, or um, even some kind of pec legs or prosthetics. Um, so they don't connect to him with that. Um, but when I was about five, I have this strong memory of being about five years old and being asked, who is your favorite Jólasveit? And I would say, because I felt that I should, it was some kind of something that I needed to do, was to say it was Tekestur. Uh, 
in my five-year-old heart, it was, however, stover. But I, held, I felt obligated to say it was Stekkesburg, and I didn't understand why, uh, but I did. In recent years, I have actually come to recognize why I felt that obligation, and it's no longer an obligation. He absolutely is one of my favorites. I mean, we sit down every year and, and discuss this whole thing and what it can do and if he can become a disability activist. Um, so, of course, he's my favorite now because we have this connection. I see myself in him and I did see myself in him when I was little as well, even if I didn't realize it. And nobody took the chance to actually talk about it with me. I wish they would have, but they haven't. So I want to do that now. I want to talk to children that can find themselves in the diversity that we can find within the group of Yolosvenar because there are more um, uh, more variety than only uh, Stekester, he's just the one that I connect with. Because we have this connection of having a different body, using some kind of prosthetics. Which by the way, we should maybe check that out because of course I have people that make my prosthetics. so. I would think that Stackester does as well, so maybe we should check that out. My name is Gudmundur Magnusson. I'm working in the field of orthotics and prosthetics. Orthoses are splints and prosthetics are prosthesis for artificial limbs. And uh, my profession is orthotist and prosthetist. Is Stackester your client? Uh, no comment. No comment is <clears throat> maybe the biggest yes we can get, as Gwimmutur can of course not break privilege towards his clients. So at least I would take that no comment as big fat yes, that Stakestur is his client, or at least they have some kind of situation going on. And I would think so, uh, because I can't believe that Stackerstead would not use modern technology and, and get really the creme of the crop of technology in, in prosthetics and, and good shoes and all of these things that are possible. Hello, someone is coming on a sled. Um, that's just fun. Um, but yeah, I would think he would absolutely go for those things. And if he doesn't, he should. Um, because I know how I know from personal experience what it's like to be walking in deep snow in Iceland when you can't bend a knee. It's not always fun. We love the snow, we love the nature, but I think the municipalities, for example, why don't they make sure that all the walkways are cleared of snow to make it easier for him when he comes? I think he should go into that. Um, and I have actually seen somebody do a drawing of him when he had these like very spiffy, sporty, like uh, prosthetics going on. So I think he absolutely is there. But back to the core of it, he's part of a living tradition that is ever changing and is speaking into and out of uh, the mindset of every time. So I think this is the perfect time for Stakester and some of his brothers to actually start stepping into the role of uh, representing not only the singularity and the uniformity of the family and the nation, if we could say so, but also recognize their individuality, not only towards food, which is, which is of course important, but their physical, uh, mental abilities and diversity and beauty in that. And I think in that sense, our fantastic Christmas tradition uh, of these brothers, I think they can step into that role. And I think Stakester would become more popular if he would do that. Because children know diversity and they love diversity. They just don't realize that Stakester is part of that. On a very windy December evening in Iceland, Thank you for joining me for this little trip. Uh, I hope you have had fun. And on behalf of myself and Stekkestur, the no-show, I wish you uh, an eventful and warm advent and a very, very happy holidays.